Hello and welcome. Thank you for tuning in for our 2022 Water Connects Us fundraising celebration. I'm John Link Stein, Executive Director at Freshwater, a Minnesota nonprofit on a mission to inspire and empower people to value and preserve water. I'm welcoming you tonight from the beautiful conservatory and botanical collection here at the University of Minnesota College of Biological Sciences. A long time freshwater partner and sponsor dating back to our founder, Dick Gray. Water Connects Us is our fundraising benefit in which sponsors, members, and donors like you come together to celebrate Minnesota's rich water heritage and the important role we each play in protecting it. Through your caring donations, you'll help us raise $65,000 for programs that are hard at work to protect the water we value. Tonight, we have many special segments of entertainment teed up for you. First, in our pre-show, Twin Cities chef and food writer Beth Dooley is back to cook up something fun for us using ingredients that are good for the planet and for people. Then, we'll go live. You'll hear a variety of speakers and stories about how fresh water, with our members' support, is making a difference for healthy water and communities. And in particular, we will spotlight a special project of Freshwater's research program, a scientific study we are leading on the water impacts of a special farming system that uses regenerative practices. Now you may be wondering, what is that? What does that mean for me? Well, sit back and enjoy the show and learn how it and all of us can protect the water we depend on daily. Now, without further ado, Thank you again for joining us. Let's begin by heading over to Beth Dooley's to cook. I'm so glad to be with you today, Beth, in your own home, in your kitchen. Thank you for hosting us, and thank you for, for showing us again your amazing cooking skills. Thank you. Oh, it's wonderful to have you here. Thanks for coming. Yeah. yeah. And so today, we're just going to really be featuring some of your amazing food again. But we're going to be focusing it in a way on some new products and some of our existing work that we're featuring on how healthy soil and healthy water leads to healthy food. So that's going to be great. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Beth. If people haven't met you before, just say a little bit about who you are. Well, I've been writing about food for about the past 40 years or so. And I'm really interested in how where food comes from affects flavor. So you're giving me too much credit. I'm, I'm an okay cook, but when I buy food and grow food that comes from beautifully taken care of soil, that provides all of these ecological services, protects our water, harbors pollinators, provides economic opportunities for people to grow food on the land. A lot of our beginning farmers, a lot of our black and indigenous farmers are all now creating these wonderful products using food that it's grown responsibly. And to me, frankly, it all starts with flavor. And flavor comes from how the food is grown, how it's handled, and how close it is to my kitchen. And so the reason why I do this and write about this is I think we can all become part of this incredible regenerative food chain. And fresh water is a huge part of that because without water, we wouldn't have this beautiful food and we wouldn't be standing here right and, now. And as we know, water is life. It All is. of us are 70% exactly. or more water That's in our right. bodies. In fact, infants are even more than that. So it's just an amazing uh, connection between water and soil and our health. And then a great economy. I love that story about just growing a local economy. Yeah, yeah, it's really important and I'm delighted to be part of it. Well, so thanks. thank you. What are you working on these days? Tell us a little bit about your project. Oh, you're great. Thanks. So I just had a book come out called The Perennial Kitchen, which talks about the importance of doing this work because again, we get this beautiful food that's local, that comes from nearby, that tastes amazing, that also provides these ecological services to our land, to our water, to our pollinators, to our economy, all these things. And so the whole thing is that we cooks can become part of this regenerative food chain. So that book just came out. And then I also have a wonderful project with my son that started during the pandemic, and it's called Bare Bones Cooking. And it's about getting back to the essentials, because once you learn some of the basic techniques of cooking, 
whether it's roasting, whether it's stir frying, whether it's sauteing or braising or making a soup, you can cook anything any time of year. And so it really is to give cooks the tools to adapt what they're cooking for dinner to whatever is coming in locally. So you're not marching into the supermarket going with a recipe going, I need this, this, and this. You're simply looking at what is coming out of the farmer's market or out of your backyard or from these beautiful farms and going, oh, I'm going to roast these carrots or I'm going to roast these beautiful asparagus, right? Yeah. So that's the whole point of that. Um, it's a blog and it's also a series of cooking classes. Wow, that sounds like so much fun. It's really fun. And, it's really and fun. So, so you, you teach people through your blog and you show them. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. It's like having me standing next to you in the kitchen saying, let's do this and this. So, so you'd be like a personal chef. Yes. Coach. Exactly. I'm a coach. I, I love that. I love that. Absolutely. <laughs> and and if people wanted to learn more about all of that, where would they go to find that out? You're so nice. It's all on my website. And that's Beth Dooley's Kitchen. Dot com. So just think of you and I standing here in Beth Dooley's kitchen, and you'll find me that way. Well, you know, now that I've been here, I think I will be able to imagine <laughs> it much better myself. But tell us a little bit today. What, what, are, you, what are we going to be preparing today in the kitchen? I'm so excited to have these tree-range chickens from Rahe's Farm. And, um, you know, they're just gorgeous. Look at the color of these chickens, yeah. right? Beautiful. And they're beautiful free range. He calls them tree range. There's something about poultry when it gets to free range and be outside and eat grubs and I mean think about it. It's a much healthier bird yeah. so it's going to produce much healthier meat. The other thing about these um, free range birds is that they have bigger thighs and smaller breasts but those thighs are where all the flavor in a chicken is. Yeah. So they're wonderful for roasting and while most people think oh I don't have time to roast a chicken what we're going to do is called spatchcock a chicken, uh -huh. which means dispatch the chicken by cutting out the backbone and opening it up flat, and that chicken is going to cook in about 30 minutes. Wow. So you end up with a really delicious whole chicken. The other reason why you want to cook the whole bird is that there's more flavor when you cook the whole thing because all of those joints and all of those bones um, are all together, right? When you cut a chicken up, you kind of lose the mass. Yeah. You have more flavor that way. You have more juices that way. And this does it really quickly. That's so awesome. we're going to have fun doing that. Yeah. Well, that sounds fantastic. And you know, we're going to put these recipes and connections to all of this on our website at freshwater.org. So great. it's going to be great. You know, now might be a really good time to bring our, uh, our research and policy director, Carrie Jennings, into the kitchen with us. She's an amazing chef yeah. and gardener of yeah. her own, right? Yeah. And, yeah, and a really good friend. She's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> I'm such a fan of Carrie. I'm the sous chef today. Yeah, <laughs> so we're just thrilled that, that we're able to join you today and that you're able to do this uh, teaching for all of us. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what we'll, we'll make today. Yeah, it'll, we'll have fun. Hello, friends of Freshwater. I am Reginaldo Hasbet Marroquin. I'm here with uh, Salvatierra Farms, and we are so grateful to all of you who have decided to support us in building this farm, transplanting all of these beautiful hazelnuts into the new space where we are protecting the land in partnership with you. So thank you very much for carrying this fundraising for us and for helping Salvatierra Farm become another one of those regenerative operations here in Minnesota, protecting our land, the water, and the future of our communities. Hi, I'm Mariah Rufer, a watershed planner and lake manager at Houston Engineering. Growing up in Minnesota, my love of its lakes and water bodies has spurred a passion for protecting and enhancing Minnesota's most valuable resource. Over the years, I've seen the important work that the Freshwater Society has completed and am encouraged by the progress they have made. We at Houston Engineering are happy to support them and are excited to see what they do next. Hi, I'm Peter Go. I'm sitting here by White Bear Lake on April 15th. It's cold and windy and the ice just went out yesterday, so so much for spring so far. Anyhow, I've been connected with uh, Freshwater, the Freshwater Society and Richard Grave almost for 50 years. I'm a big fan of the work of the organization and John Linkstein. I've worked on water quality and water appropriation issues, access issues for the St. Croix, Mississippi, and Lake Superior for a long time, both in the state and federal government. And of course, a couple of high 
tech companies and now as a citizen the last 15 years and I really value the work Freshwater is doing. So have a great meeting. So we're going to spatchcock this chicken? Yes, we are. And spatchcock simply means dispatch the cock, right? And like you said, it's probably an old term that was used on bigger birds, yeah. like roosters maybe. I know they do it with turkeys sometimes. The thing right. I love about it is it really speeds up the cooking of a whole bird. And tell me about, I mean, you've got this kind of dried out, and that's intentional, It right? is intentional, yeah. What we did is these chickens right now are being sold frozen. So people need to know they're going to need to buy them a couple of days before they serve them. Mm -hmm. You put them in the refrigerator and let them dethaw. When they're partially dethawed, take them out of that plastic. Do not wash them. The FDA has now said do not wash your poultry. Okay. Just cook it because any bacteria on it is going to be killed in the oven. But the reason why I take the plastic off is because that dries out the skin, mm -hmm. right? And you end up with a much crisper skin that way. Yeah. And you get a really delicious, juicy bird. And that's what these are. So you had it in the fridge on this paper towel yes. for a day or so. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And look at the color of the Isn't fat. I mean, that is so different looking than the chickens that I'm used to seeing. It's so, his chickens are so yeah. pretty. And they're a special variety that are really, they're a heritage bird. Mm -hmm. And they've been bred to have bigger thighs, yep. really juicy meat. They're a little bigger than a lot of the chickens you buy in the store, which means they have more flavor. Yeah. So they taste more like a chicken. And the first, <laughs> the, the first trick about spatchcocking is the back, recognizing the back and yes. the breast. Yes. So we're going to exactly. turn it over. Yes. These don't have very large chicken breasts, no. but we're going to turn it over to the back. Exactly. I'm going to just wipe that up a little yep. bit, trying to be tidy here. Yep. <laughs> The scientist, yes. right? Yes, <laughs> and so what's your approach okay. to... You know, I have to confess, I'm, I'm a very sloppy cook. Yeah, and, um, you do what has to be done. Yes, you do what has to be done. You kind of feel around for the backbone. I like to actually start here at that end? because okay. it's easier so to find the, the bone. See where the neck is? Yeah. That's kind of where the bone starts. And don't be afraid, you may have to crack through some bones. Okay, so we're going to go at the neck here. Mm -hmm. And you just have to feel your way through, Carrie. Yeah, so I'm that cutting, girl. Cutting through those You're ribs. You're cutting through the ribs a little bit. Yep. Oh, that's not as hard as I thought it would no. be. I don't want to cut your hand. No, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I have done this before. Yes, I know. Just a couple times. It just is, yeah, it's just a matter of just kind of feeling your way through. You're fine. And it's opening it up so it, you just don't, you it, don't have that cold spot in the middle of the bird. Exactly. And then you can hang on to the backbone and make yeah. a nice, yep, go ahead and pull. I want to see where that is. Yep, there I'm you all, go. all the way through. There you go. And then you can throw that backbone into the soup pot. Where, which am I, which side of this, is that the, okay, so I'm yep. going to pop that bone yep, out yep, of the joint here. Yep, yep, do that. Here. That a girl. Okay, there yep. you go. There you go. This probably would have been easier with reading glasses. <laughs> You know, it's really all by feel. They wouldn't have helped. Yeah. You're doing great. This is great. There you go. All right. There you go. Okay. okay, one side done. Okay, one side done. Now, if you don't <clears throat> feel like doing that, you can leave that in and open it up But anyway. we want to use that bone. I yeah. think it's better to do it. Yeah, I think now that I, I've yeah, seen it. Yeah, now you've got it. Okay, your, your fingers look the no, same color as this chicken. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, good girl. You've got it. Yeah. This, I think it's going to result in so much more usable and accessible meat, too. Because it does. Because there's some nice meat on the back that usually just gets wasted. That's right. That's right. You get that nice oyster. You just, you get oh, is that what you call it? The yeah. little oyster? Yeah, that nice little, you know, sort of thing okay. that hides in the little Oops. cavity of the, lose those. the shoulder of the chicken. Yeah, there you go. That's Not great. You got it. Keep going. I, I thought going. I was at the thigh bone. Yep, oh, there we go. It. There we go. Brilliant. And then you just cut that off. All right. Okay. Great. I guess people could use their sewing shears if they don't have well, kitchen shears, but yeah, I would these are good to getting, have. Yeah, kitchen shears. And we're going to not waste this. Nope, we're going to put this right in, the pot. in the soup pot. Here's the soup pot right there. There okay. you go, my dear. Okay. Now. I'm just rinse my hands off here. Okay. But the next thing you're going to do, you're not done with this bird. Okay. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to kind of pull the chicken open a little bit, and you're going to whack it and press it. There you go. Oh, yeah. There yep, we go. There you go. It's okay. like CPR. Yes. <laughs> They do say it cracks when they do CPR. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, is okay, that flat enough? Okay, there that's perfect. Okay. And then it's going to go on this baking sheet. Okay. Okay. And then we have a very simple glaze. And if people want kind of that crusty burned look, they can mm -hmm. put the glaze on now. If they want it to be a little gentler, a little more glazy, put it on 
about 10 or 15 minutes before okay. you pull the chicken out of the oven. Because so it's it's there's some sugars. There's sugar in it because we're using beautiful local maple sugar, nice. which I love. Yes. And uh, then a nice um, whole grain Oh, it smells mustard. like maple syrup. Isn't that nice? Yeah. yeah. And then a little bit of this gorgeous hazelnut oil. And you have one tablespoon of this there's, maple sugar? There's one tablespoon of maple sugar, and we're going to put one tablespoon of the mustard nice in there. Nice grainy mustard. Isn't that nice? Have you ever made your own mustards? I haven't, I confess. I have some I mustard seed in my cupboard, and I want to do something oh, with it. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So we're using American, the American hazelnut, hazelnut oil. oil. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell mm -hmm. me about that. It's wonderful. Hazelnuts, as you know, are a shrubby, big shrubby tree, almost, yeah. you know, and they produce these gorgeous native. nuts. They're native to this area, and the difference between our hazelnuts, our local regional hazelnuts, and those that are coming in from Oregon and from um, Turkey is that A, they're super good for the land, mm -hmm. B, and we'll show you some a little later, but they are smaller, so they have a more intense flavor, and C, because they're being processed by the American Hazelnut Company out of Ashland, Wisconsin, okay. they oh. are toasted first, so you don't have to toast them. You know how when you use those larger yeah. nuts, the, the filberts, you have to um, toast them and then rub the peel off? You don't have to do that with oh. these, so they're okay. ready to go. They're fabulous. They're really intensely flavored. They're delicious. They're easy to work with. The other really cool thing is that they take the nuts they're not using that are maybe imperfect. They press those nuts into the hazelnut oil, right? Okay. And the hazelnut oil then has a toastier flavor than the other hazelnut oils you buy in the supermarket. The other cool thing is they take what's left of the pressing of those nuts and they grind it into flour. Nice. And we'll show you that. Oh, yeah. And it's a delicious gluten-free flour. Like for a chocolate torte or something. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Or a really good cookie with yeah. lots of chocolate. Yeah. In it. yeah. Yeah. But hazelnuts also play a role in these chickens' lives. Yes. Because, Tell us about that. Well, these chickens are tree range, not free range. Mm -hmm. um, you have to say that carefully when you're asking your yeah, grocery store yeah. if they have them. Yeah. But that means that they are running around in the shade of hazelnuts and elderberries. And Rehi has developed a system where those are kind of in alleys, in rows, and in between the rows are perennials mm -hmm. that the chickens will graze on. He supplements with some sprouted grain, yeah. like oats and triticale, and actually there's a family in his farm system now that has bought a local mill in Medelia and is providing all the grains to the chicken farmers oh, that's in the system. Yeah. They just have to make sure that the protein reaches about 20% and mm -hmm. then the birds are happy. So. That's awesome. Yeah. That's but, so great. Yeah, he realized that chickens like to be in the shade. Yeah. And that was, he grew up in Guatemala, and chickens are jungle birds. Right. And so they were just roaming around in the forest. So he tried to replicate that. So they're so the happy. Yeah, they are. <laughs> and, you know, when there's a hawk or some kind of a predator, they'll just be under the, the, the shrubs immediately. I love that. Yeah. That's you hear awesome. the whistle of the hawk and the chickens. They look, <laughs> they look at the sky a lot, actually. <laughs> So what am I doing? I put the two okay. tablespoons of hazelnut yep. oil in this. So, so for one that's really dark, we're just gonna like drizzle it over. Okay. Okay. And you can certainly use, gonna your use my hands. To, yeah. yeah. I was surprised you gave me a spoon here. Yeah. Yeah. Just Where? swish it over. Yeah. There you go. And this is just gonna make a nice kind of flavorful glaze. And that's all you need to do. I love mustard. I do too. But we're not doing any garlic or anything like that. We're not because we really don't need it. Yeah. You know. Um, you can throw a little pepper on if you want to, but there's so much flavor in that mustard. It's so salty. And that's what I was going to just say. Mm -hmm. Salt makes it nice and crisp, yeah, too, it does. doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's how easy this is. And then you're going to have a full roasted chicken in about 30 to 45 minutes, depending on the size of the bird that you're cooking. What temperature are you roasting it at? This one is at 430. It's hot. 430. Yeah, <laughs> no, 425. Sorry, 425. I'm sorry, 425. Thank you. It's just like, that's not <laughs> a number. A scientist. It's not a number you usually see. I mean, I can achieve that no. number. I mean, that's the thing. You know, when I cook chickens, it doesn't really matter what temperature. You put them in the yeah. oven, and you cook them until they're yeah. done, right? Do you put, use an oven thermometer? I want to get this spread out better. Thank you. You can, but you kind of know when the um, flesh is, is not quite as springy, mm -hmm. right? And then you cut it, and if the juices run clear, there's no blood in the juices, and there's no pink in the flesh, then that's, you know you're going to be pretty That's close. definitely how my son does meat, is by the yeah, touch. By the touch. Yeah. yeah, and he even compares it to touching different parts, like your cheek or your chin or your nose. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> your well, son cooks too, right? Yeah, he does. I yeah, learn, I a, learn really a lot good from cook. my son. Yeah, isn't that fun? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really fun. Well, and that's why we're doing this work too, because this is really not just for us, 
but for our future. Yeah. And the work that um, Fresh Water is doing is really about protecting the world for the generations to come. Yeah. And that's why it's so important. Yeah. And it's, yeah, and it's healthier for them. Yeah, exactly. My son just said yesterday that by shopping organically in a, his local co-op, he has fewer bad choices. Yes, to make. it makes life <laughs> yeah. so much easier, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, somebody's already made those decisions for you. Right, yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So we're just going to throw yes, this in. Yes, throw it in the oven. Okay. Here, go, my dear. Okay, open it up. Yep. Top shelf, bottom uh, shelf. I would put it down. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dave Luthie and I am on the Freshwater Board and uh, just a quick story to uh, how water connects us better. I'm in my kitchen here and when I turn on the faucet, water comes out and uh, that happens in your house too. And so we all depend on drinking water supply uh, for all of our uses in the, in the kitchen and the bathroom and things that you can do is to conserve that water uh, by using less so that we can uh, make sure there's enough for future uh, generations. I also have on a shirt that says Vital Ground. Uh, the land around us is really important in managing that water supply because as we take water out for our use, it needs to be replaced and that usually comes from above uh, in the form of rain and runoff and what soaks into the ground and moves through. And so we have to take care of our lands that we live on, the communities and the areas that we, uh, we live and work and play in, and make sure that the water that's going back in has a chance to be as clean as possible so that uh, future generations will have a clean supply of water. And so I encourage you to do what you can to conserve water at home, watch what you're doing in product use, uh, chemicals that you apply or use on the ground or in the land or uh, for all kinds of different reasons. And so it all helps. Uh, we need to do this together and it won't happen unless we all do it together. So water does connect us all and I hope you're enjoying the, uh, the uh, video. Uh, presentations tonight. Thank you. So, looks ready. Beautiful char on that, which I like. Yeah, I do too. But if people don't want it quite that charred, they can put a little foil tent over it. Part way exactly. Through, or exactly. you said add the glaze part Or they through. can add the glaze later. They can add the glaze about 20 minutes before they pull the chicken out of the oven. So it's whatever you want. Yeah. It's very flexible. And you're not worried about me putting the hot pan on the granite, Tell right? us why. Well, because <laughs> granite geologist. cooked at thousands of degrees, so it can handle hot. That's one benefit of having it in it the kitchen. Is. It's great. And this is local granite, yeah. too. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I wonder which one it is. <laughs> okay, well, one of the reasons why I like to always buy whole chickens, yes. even if they look like they're going to be a little more expensive, is that you can get two or three meals out of them. You certainly can. And actually, pound per pound, they're not more expensive. Right. Yeah. You know, they really are a good deal. And you get the benefit of being able to hang out of the bones and any of the scraps you're not going to eat, yeah. and you can make a great stock. So we're going to do that next. And if I'm not ready to make a stock the same day, I'll just throw those things in the freezer. Exactly the bones. right. Exactly even after right. we've eaten the bones. And yeah. Even after you've eaten the bones. And by the way, if you don't have time to do chicken and you end up buying a roasted chicken, right? Hey, that makes good stuff. Save the too. bones. They yeah. make fabulous stuff. Yeah. yeah. So. And then I do that with my vegetable scraps too. Yes, so exactly. anything that's kind of looks like it's going to go bad, I yep. throw it into the freezer until I'm ready to make yep. stock. Yep. So you've got some I've green got some onions, onions that started to sprout a little bit, mm -hmm. the backbone, some carrots, mm -hmm. yep. and cold water. Yep. I always start with cold. I, and I think I've heard that just because you don't want what comes out of your hot water tank to be in your food. Exactly. Exactly. That's a good point. Yeah. I That's mean, a really good point. It yeah. sits there for a while and you don't know what it's picking up or growing. Exactly. No. And I, I think we can throw, I think I threw a bay leaf in there. I saw a bay leaf yeah. on the counter. Yeah, oh, yeah. Leaf. I yep. see the bay in there. And if you happen to have any old dried herbs lying around, you can sprinkle a few of those in. And this is going to be a nice rich stock. We're not putting in a lot of water. No. Is that maybe a quart or so? Exactly. And we're just going to put it on the back of the stove here. Okay. Get it going. Okay. Okay. So the stock is on low, oh, it'll be on low on the back burner couple hours. So why don't I work on the asparagus yeah. while uh, Link comes we in? We could use another cook yes, in this kitchen. Use there cook. are never <laughs> enough cooks in my kitchen. Hi, Link. Hi, Beth. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. This has been amazing to watch. Isn't I mean, this fun? I can't wait to taste it, to be honest. That's it's going to be, be fun. Best. Yeah. It's going to be really fun. Awesome. So this is the soup. We're heating this up because Carrie's going to throw the asparagus in there. Got it. Okay. We're going to get the tortillas going. 
this is the hazelnut here. oil. And one of the really cool things about this hazelnut oil, again, which I'm in love with, as you can tell, is that it has a higher smoke point than does olive oil. Oh. So it comes from this area. It doesn't need to be imported. It has all those wonderful omega-3s. It's cold pressed. But you can use it to cook things at a higher temperature than you can olive oil. So it's a wonderful product. I didn't great. know that, that about great? the smoke point. Yeah. yeah. So we're just going to drizzle a little bit. Just film it in the pan. Yep. That's it, Link. Yep. Get it all. Get it all. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yep. yep. And then we're just going to sizzle a couple of these really beautiful tortillas. This is, um, these are made of heirloom corn. And again, it's a much better grain than the corn and soy that grow mm -hmm. on conventional farms. This is also um, nixtamalized, which is a process, very ancient process, where the corn is soaked in an alkaline mixture. It used to be wood ash. Now they use a chemical. But what that does is it opens up all of the nutrients in the corn, and it makes it accessible to our bodies in a way that just cornmeal isn't accessible to us. And You're she's right. testing the smoke point of this oil. I, know. I see. So Link we're just going to see. There. All right, here we go. <laughs> I know. Here we go. All right. So we're, gonna let, we're just going to do a couple of these because this is going to be how we're going to finish the soup. And Carrie, I'm going to throw some of your beautiful yeah. asparagus in here. These tortillas are beautiful. Aren't they gorgeous? You know, they, they've got okay. they've got a nice substance to them. Yeah. Go ahead and flip those. Right? We're just we're basically just toasting them. We just want them until they're kind of bubbly. There you go. Perfect. Bubbly and a little brown. Yeah. There you go. All right. I think we're good. All right. Yeah. All right. Great. Just Perfect. Here we're gonna drain them a little yep, bit. Drain them a little bit yep, and then we'll chop them up. up. Yep. Perfect. There you go. And I think that'll be good. Awesome. All right. And these are made right in Minneapolis. Isn't that nice? And then when we go to serve this, we're going to cut up. And this is just, you know, it's so nice to garnish this with things. We are going to cut up a little bit of an avocado. So we'll have that. So we'll just put this in a bowl with a few limes on the side. So when people go to have their soup, they can throw some avocado. And some lime, and you're going to go. And some pinto beans. And some pinto beans if they nice, want. Yeah, nice. exactly. So what are we drinking? We're going to drink a Minnesota mule. Oh, okay. Great. So it's going to be this gorgeous um, elderberry syrup. Mm -hmm. It's such a beautiful color. And elderberries are so good for you. They're doing all Let kinds of, right yeah. And we're going to use a little ginger ale, okay, and a little lime. Right, like you would with the classic mule. Isn't that pretty? Look at that. So you sort of squeeze a little, a little lime, lime in there, right? Uh -huh. I love that. That's great. Well, cheers. cheers. Thank you so much for the work you're doing. Thank you. This is great. Thanks for Thank hosting you. us again, Beth. It's been fantastic. It's really fun. Hi, I'm Jake McHenry, co-founder and CEO of Float, Minnesota's boat sharing platform. Uh, and we met Mary in Freshwater about three or four years ago and have been supporters ever since. Um, as lifelong boaters, we understand the value and the life that freshwater brings to our lakes and rivers here in Minnesota. And the work being done by freshwater is vital to preserve our lakes and rivers for generations to enjoy. Hey, freshwater. I'm Eric. This is Ray. We're with Boulder Printing here in Minneapolis. We've been working with freshwater for over a decade doing their wall calendars and their engagement calendars. They're a beautiful piece. Hey, and we sure love your mission of, of making water clean and accessible. We love the environmental stance that you take and the work we do. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to sponsor you today. All right, so the chicken, you know, I always like to let the chicken rest after it comes out of the oven um, because that way when you roast a chicken or any big hunk of meat, it draws the juices up out to the surface of the meat, right? And you need to let the chicken relax a little bit. Now, I don't know about you, but I love dark meat chicken. And mm -hmm. this leg is just dying to be set free, right? <laughs> so we're going to start with this. Beautiful. Isn't that pretty? Lovely. And then we're going to serve this with maybe some of the steamed asparagus or um, a nice hunk of cornbread or maybe some of those tortillas, yeah. you know, whatever you want. But there you go. Keeping it all in the family. Beth, thank you so much, this for, so much fun. for cooking with us today and for just the, the knowledge that you bring about how healthy food is so connected to our, our water and our healthy soil and uses of the land and now a healthy economy as well. So great. And for those of you out there that are just kind of tuning in, please stick with us for the rest of our Water Connects Us celebration tonight. We're going to have more of a story about Rahe's farm. We've talked about Rahe, Haslett, Marikeen, and we want you to know more about his story as we uh, go into our celebration of Water Connects Us tonight. Stick around.
Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight for Freshwater's annual fundraising celebration, Water Connects Us. I'm Laura Betker, your host and a CARE 11 meteorologist. I'm delighted to be here to join with you to protect water for Minnesotans. Good evening, Laura, and thanks for being with you us bet. here again this year. Healthy water is the lifeblood of our Minnesota communities. We depend on it every day, yet it's so easy to take it for granted when we turn on the tap, take a shower, or drink in the view of our favorite lake or stream. For those of you just joining, I'm John Link Stein, Executive Director at Freshwater. And I go by my middle name, Link. Public service and water has been my life's passion. I've done this work for over 40 years, but I've gotta say that that cooking with Beth, Beth Dooley was super fun. Looked delicious. It was great. I had a delightful time, and Beth was such a gracious host for our pre-show. But the next half hour is critically important for all of us at Freshwater. Our small but powerful team needs your support to continue our work for water in Minnesota and beyond. That's right, Link, it sure is. The next 30 minutes, we're here to raise $65,000 for Freshwater programs, programs that are hard at work in our communities, protecting the lakes and streams and drinking water that we value. We'll learn why they're so important to solving some of the biggest water challenges we face. And as a sustainability advocate myself, my goal is that we can all leave here tonight with a better understanding of how water connects to our food, our health, and our ways of life. And to help us tonight, please welcome to the stage my friend and freshwater board member, Rissica Adesagan. Rissica is the chair, co-chair of our development committee, and she is the director of communications in her hometown, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Welcome, Rissica. Thanks, Link. It's great to be here tonight. Giving back to the community is so important to me. Nonprofits like Freshwater wouldn't exist without donations from people like us, me and you. And that's what tonight is all about, providing clean and safe water for Minnesotans by pooling together our resources for water. <laughs> Did you catch that? Pooling? You know I love water puns. I, Rissica, I thought I was in charge of the bad dad jokes tonight. <laughs> but you're right. Charitable donations are essential for us. And tonight, we need your help to reach our $65,000 goal for all of our programs before June 30th. At Freshwater, our fiscal year starts on July 1st. Tonight's fundraising helps fill our general operating budget for the year for the programs we bring to the community to advance research, empower people, and advocate for change. So whether you're out there watching from Duluth, Long Lake, or the lab at Lansing, Mich in Mis Michigan State in Lansing, we hope you're enjoying the show. And a special shout out to our watch parties tonight at the University of Minnesota Campus Club, mm -hmm. Town Hall Brewery, and the Contented Cow in Northfield. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and some great news. 
Some generous donors, Charlie and Emily Kelly, have stepped up again this year with a matching gift to inspire others to donate to such a worthy cause. The next 50 donations will be matched up to $10,000. So give now and double your impact for water. And a gift of any size counts. Wow, that's exciting, Link. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful news. What a great way to stretch your dollars even further. For viewers at home, there are many ways to give throughout our program tonight. The easiest might be to pick up your mobile device and click on Make a Donation in the menu of our online giving center. You may also give by check made payable to Freshwater, or by credit card over the phone. Or you can visit our website at freshwater.org slash donate. Check out the instructions on the bottom of your screen. And of course, there's the online auction. There are some amazing packages there to peruse. Right now, our auction sales are almost $9,000. Keep bidding and help bring that up. There's a fly fishing lesson, pub crawls throughout the Twin Cities, and one of my personal favorites, two beautiful oak charcuterie boards made in honor of dear friend and longtime environmental advocate Darby Nelson, who passed away this past winter. The boards are made of oak logs salvaged by Darby. Darby was such an inspiration, a true advocate for Minnesotans and the water that connects us, as are our many sponsors. That's right, and tonight we'd like to give them a special thank you. First off, We'd like to thank our evening's hosts, who, by the way, got some pretty cool swag bags mm -hmm. as part of their host tickets. And we're going to be giving away two swag bags and a couple of other goodies at the end of our program, so stick around. We'd also like to thank our steering committee members and our incredible volunteers. And a special thank you to all our sponsors, including Phyllis and Roger Sherman, Peter Gove, Culligan Water, Houston Engineering, Stantec, Dr. Ed Ellinger, Barr Engineering, Emmons Olivier Resources, the law firm of Fredrickson and Byron, ISG Engineering, the University of Minnesota College of Biological Sciences, and Excel Energy. Yes, and to each and every one of you, thank you for being with us tonight and for donating to protect water for future generations. Minnesota really is a special place when it comes to water. Tell us more, Riska. Well, Minnesota is home to over 11,000 lakes and countless meandering streams and mighty rivers, vast acres of wetlands, and we border the greatest freshwater body in the world, a lake so great that its name is superior. Did you catch that link? <laughs> Even our state's name, derived from the Dakota language, translates to the land of sky-tinted waters. And we acknowledge the indigenous people in our region who have cared for and protected water for generations. We depend on this water for fishing, boating, for use in our homes, for agriculture and business, for sanitation and public health, and so much more. And everything we do on the land impacts our water. You're absolutely right, Risica. That's so true. The water that flows out of Minnesota through the Mississippi River connects two countries 10 states and supplies 41% of the drinking water in the continental United States. 98% of the water that flows out of Minnesota fell on Minnesota. Only 2% flows in from our neighbors. A single drop of water that falls from the sky in Minnesota might flow downstream, connecting to the Gulf of Mexico, to Hudson Bay in Canada, or the St. Lawrence Seaway after it leaves the Great Lakes and beyond which is why it's so important for us to care for and protect our waters before they travel downstream. It's the right and neighborly thing to do. But the reality is, water in Minnesota and downstream is under constant threat. Did you know that 56% of Minnesota waters are impaired, failing to meet one or more state water quality standards? And in some areas, our groundwater, which 75% of Minnesotans rely on to drink, is contaminated or being used faster than it can be replenished. Climate change is compounding all these water challenges, including how water moves across the landscape. Warmer temperatures are driving heavier, more intense rainfall, accelerating stream bank erosion and delivering more pollutants to our lakes. The water temperature of Minnesota lakes is increasing as well, and that can affect the abundance and species of fish found in central and northern Minnesota lakes. And our 
water treatment systems are aging. In fact, many in small communities date back to the Great Depression. Freshwater is advocating at the legislature for funds that are needed to modernize Minnesota's water infrastructure. But the list of threats doesn't stop there. The Minnesota River in southern Minnesota is one of the largest contributors to the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, an area at the mouth of the Mississippi where pollution has zapped oxygen out of the water, so it no longer supports normal and healthy aquatic life. And to make matters worse, research shows that black, indigenous, and other people of color and rural communities are hit the hardest by challenges resulting from climate change. This includes a lot, challenges like flooding, reduced water quality for recreation, and so much more. But there is good news. With your help, Freshwater is here to advance research, support community learning about water, and advocate for equitable changes. With your help, we can keep working to clean up the water that we Minnesotans value. Because of our work at the Minnesota Capitol last year, we were able to get a law passed and funded to increase how water is stored on the land to reduce stream bank erosion and improve water quality in the Minnesota River. With your support, Freshwater can grow programs like Adopt a River, which engages people throughout Minnesota in shoreline cleanups for our waterways. Like all that mask trash. Yuck. <laughs> With your help, we can continue to expand programs like the Minnesota Water Stewards, which trains and supports volunteers to make a difference for clean water in their neighborhoods and communities. We can connect with the Minnesota Legislature, hashtag MinLeg, on policies and funding for water protection, where our voice is respected by legislators on both sides of the aisle and by state and local governments. And we can build more partnerships for science and research in Minnesota and across the Midwest like the one we'd like to tell you about next. Freshwater, with initial support from the Mortensen Foundation, launched a long-term study on a farm near Northfield that is growing things differently. The land used to be farmed using conventional practices, but is transitioning to regenerative methods, something you heard about. Us, we talked about it with Beth, if you tuned into the pre-show. We're studying the benefits for soil and water health of these regenerative growing practices that promise water, soil, and climate change benefits and deliver delicious, flavorful foods to our tables. For the next few minutes, we invite you to travel with us to the newly opened conservatory at the University of Minnesota St. Paul campus to learn more about how Freshwater is partnering to research regenerative agriculture and hear from a special farmer who is building a movement. When summer finally does arrive, I look forward to enjoying fresh local vegetables with grilled chicken. It's one of my favorite meals. I try to make sure that my food choices are helping our soil and water health and the farmers who grow the food. In Minnesota, corn and soybeans, commodity crops that are used for animal feed and biofuels, occupy nearly all of Minnesota's agricultural watersheds. From the Minnesota River Basin, and increasingly to the upper Mississippi Basin. Minnesota's watersheds are the main contributors to oxygen depletion that lead to the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. At Freshwater, we want to support research and policy solutions to these intractable water quality problems. One approach is to replace a percentage of the corn and soybean acreage with locally grown food. Locally grown food that consumers want to buy, that farmers make money growing, and that actually restores soil health, improves water quality, and helps combat climate change. Here at Freshwater, we're excited to tell you about a research partnership that we are a part of to do just this. A partnership that uses Freshwater's research and science expertise to understand how regenerative farming practices restore soil health and improve water quality instead of depleting soil and requiring chemical additives to sustain crops while compromising groundwater and surface water. Regenerative agriculture is the opposite of all of that. 
Reginaldo Haslett Marroquin is our farmer partner in this work. He's Mayan Guatemalan and is known for his innovative approach to agricultural systems and environmental justice. He was part of the force behind Peace Coffee. I've known Ray He since I met him at his first ever presidential year caucus after he became a citizen. And for years, I also filled up my VW with biodiesel at his place and watched his farm evolve. Ray He currently has more than 12 farm families following his poultry methods across Minnesota and Wisconsin, and more spanning the Americas, actually. And his approach is to plant a mixture of low-growing perennials that are alley cropped with woody shrubs like hazelnuts and elderberries. And then these happy chickens graze and eat sprouted grain and have forage, shade, and shelter at night. But the key to this system is that it also gives back. It provides habitat for pollinators and songbirds and other species. And as the chickens graze, they fertilize, and that's part of the magic. And the plants are nourished naturally. This means that the soil surface remains intact a stable structure develops and that provides for the bulk of the life, which is actually microscopic, because healthy soil is alive. Let's hear about Rehi's philosophy in his own words in a short recording that we have from a recent conference held in Albert Lee called the Poultry Convergence. At the end, this is what it will look like, the whole farm. This is the picture of the farm I've been working on for the last 11 years. And there will be happy chickens in there too. Rehi was primarily interested in a farmer-friendly approach that didn't require a lot of land, cash inputs, fertilizer, or risk to enter the system. He had his eye on helping the small immigrant farmer who knew how to farm, but was excluded in this country because of the capital investments required, like he was. But he also wanted small family farms to be profitable. He wasn't focused on the complete suite of environmental benefits that we are, at least initially, but he knew that by relying on indigenous methods, he would arrive at a more sustainable solution. So as Freshwaters Research and Policy Director, I reached out to Rehi initially to be on our board, but I nixed that idea because of how busy he seemed. And instead, by the end of our coffee, we came up with a research project. And then I recruited a team of scientists to help me collect the data from the soils on his new farm. We were going to measure the soils before, during, and after conversion from conventional to regenerative practices. And Ray, he welcomed this opportunity to demonstrate that there were benefits to his methods. And we wanted to understand the potential to improve water quality in these watersheds, not just locally in the Cannon River, but also across southern Minnesota. Because Ray, he ultimately hopes to achieve 5% of the poultry market in Minnesota. At Freshwater, we focus on using science and research to build more durable and sustainable systems that protect and restore water. These regenerative farming and grazing practices rebuild soil organic matter, improve degraded soil biodiversity, and reverse climate change by sequestering carbon in the soil. In the end, that not only means reduced carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but also an improved water cycle. Carrie, how does healthy soil help all of us? Well, a healthy soil soaks in and retains water, and that reduces runoff. And then a healthy soil also holds nutrients that are typically lost with the runoff. And that means sediment, nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon are all reduced when you have a healthy soil. And much of this work is not done by the plants on the land, but by the organisms that we rarely think of. They're a diverse population of bacteria and fungi and other microorganisms that are critical to storing carbon in the soil. They change the actual physical structure of the soil and improve its function over time. So these practices can rebuild the lost biological capacity of the soil. That's right. Um, conventional fields have really impoverished populations of these microorganisms and regenerative practices not only increase the number of them, but the diversity of what's living in the soil. Especially when farmers are using rotational grazing and other practices to build healthy soil, they're restoring diversity of microorganisms faster than by just having the perennial vegetation alone. And these critters are important in other ways. They're the main producers and digesters of carbon in the soil, making soil the largest terrestrial store of carbon. This means if you increase carbon in the soil, you're taking it out of the atmosphere. So Rehi's chickens are contributing to the solution for climate change and reducing greenhouse gases while they're improving water quality. 
So let's return to how all of this ties into freshwater's work. Over time, the research team that Carrie organized will track and quantify the soil's improved ability to filter and hold water by measuring the soil's density, its structure and microbial community, the total carbon and greenhouse gas exchange, as well as the quality of the water that ultimately does leave fields. In a comparison to a neighboring orchard that has been under grass cover for 30 years, they can already see that the conventional farm fields have a long way to go. Freshwater's research with our partners will span five years, and during that time we'll deliver crucial information on how to quantify regenerative agriculture's contributions to improving water quality. Rehi can use this information, of course, to help market his products and grow his system. And after the data collection and analysis, Freshwater will use these findings to help shape the policy that we promote at the state level and make sure that regenerative agriculture is included in long-lasting benefits for water across Minnesota. Sometimes when a legislative solution seems out of reach, a grassroots, market-based approach can help shift attitudes and change the landscape. For Rehi's part, He's started a movement, and it's exciting for Freshwater to be just a small part of that. This is how you build a movement, structured, deliberate, systemic, so that you can then be permanently placed in the landscape to move, to move people from where they are unhappy and unrealized to a space where we can collectively succeed. Capital from a place that is destroying the planet to a place that can regenerate it wealth from consumers that is going to conventional systems over to regenerative systems. That's what we call, from an ancestral perspective, a movement. A movement is not a, a, a for us, is not something that is limited to going and protesting and being against systems that don't work. A movement is about moving into what we want so that we can get to the destination that we want. That is movement for us. And this gives us a fundamental blueprint where representation and inclusivity is designed and baked into the process rather than something that someone decides. Now for this to materialize, we have to make it happen and that's why we are here. Regenerative farming heals soil and water. And as Ray, he scales up his system and helps other farmers follow these methods, they will heal more land, more water. Over time, more carbon will be captured, more runoff will be avoided, and soils and rural lifestyles can be improved. Wow, such a powerful movement. I did not know about all the ecological benefits for, to those farming systems, so gifts today support projects like that? Yes, they sure do, Laura. They can help scale up the work we are supporting on Rahe's farm for healthy soil, clean water, and a sustainable local economy. Freshwater works to develop the relevant science and builds that into policy action with local governments and the Minnesota legislature. And we have some exciting news. General Mills recently announced an investment in this project so we can expand our study to more farms. And now we turn to you. We need you to give in support of scientific research projects like this one that can quantify and measure water and climate benefits. So please pause and take a moment to give to protect our water. Again, there are so many ways to give. On your mobile device, click on Make a Donation in the menu of our online giving center. Give by check made payable to Freshwater or by credit card over the phone. Or you can visit freshwater.org donate to give tonight and year round. A gift of any size can do so much. There are instructions on the bottom of your screen. We've been receiving so many lovely donations in the lead up to our fundraiser tonight and now throughout this evening. Thanks to all of you who are donating. Thanks especially for those of you in the silent auction. It's now up over $10,000 tonight. Thank you so much. And I just want to acknowledge some of our some of our donors for contributing. Nathan Zerby and Joan Nichols, thank you. Steve and Susan Woods, thank you. Laura Reynolds, Kathy Vogel, Connie Lanfear, thank you all. Gail Limborg and Carol Eichelberry, thanks for your donations. 
thank you to everyone that Ling mentioned and giving from home. And perhaps some of you watching, you're in a position to consider making fresh water part of your future charitable giving plans, such as a gift of stock through your donor advised fund, your IRA, or even including fresh water in your estate or will. For you, we invite you to please contact us anytime to learn more or discuss your giving wishes. I'm so grateful for everyone who is out there making a gift right now. If you're trying to call and we're on another line, leave a message and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. And don't forget to check out our silent auction. There are still some awesome mm -hmm. items there and the bidding remains open until noon tomorrow. Why not consider spending some of your travel and entertainment budget with us tonight? All for a great cause, helping Freshwater. Here are some examples of what's still up on the auction block. A four-day stay at a cabin on the shores of beautiful Lake Sylvia. Thank you to our board chair, Ryan Godfrey, for this amazing donation. Lake Sylvia is a lake that has great water quality, and it's just within an hour of the Twin Cities. And the guided nature walk through the University of Minnesota Arboretum with Minnesota's beloved nature expert, Jim Gilbert. Jim has been writing the nature and phenology details of the Freshwater's Weather Guide Environmental Calendar and Almanac for 45 years. Thank you, Jim, for all you do. Or take an expertly guided tour of the St. Cloud Water Treatment Plant and see for yourself how this state-of-the-art facility is cleaning up water, producing renewable energy, and creating a safe fertilizer all from treated water. And don't miss the gorgeous live edge black walnut slab dining room table handcrafted by freshwater board member Wade Campbell. And lest we not forget the incredible dinner for 10 hosted by Beth and Rahi. And maybe you're just not seeing anything to your liking in the silent auction. Would you please help us with a donation to power us forward here at Freshwater? We invite you to give now and give again. <laughs> <laughs> it takes all of us to preserve and restore Minnesota's precious water. It's a joy to see your support coming in. And I'd like to say, thank some more of our donors. Christina Kazda, Sophie Huss over there in Lansing, Josephine Marcotti, Sybil Axner, Ed Merrick. Thank you all for your donations and for your generous help. Help us move forward, propelling our work at the Minnesota State Capitol with Minnesota Water Stewards and community cleanups for water. And speaking of the Minnesota Water Stewards, let's take one more look at the silent <laughs> auction item for helping the Water Stewards with a rain barrel project. They need to have $500 for the plumbing parts to retrofit wooden barrels from a local brewery. And right now, they still need $300 to fill that $500 goal. Would you help us meet that need? Those sound really cool. <laughs> they are. Again, I want one. Wow, what a wonderful and inspiring evening here tonight. We encourage you to keep giving long after the close of our program today. Protecting water is a lifelong investment. And in addition to the gifts of treasure, I know Freshwater equally values gift of time and of talent. And as you'll see on the, on the bottom of your screen, visit our website, freshwater.org to learn about how you can get involved in preserving water in your own backyard, in your own community. You can organize a shoreline cleanup. You could consider becoming a Minnesota water steward. You could get involved with local governments who are working to keep our water clean. And if you're able, don't forget to put your dollars to work in our economy for products that are grown locally and sustainably. Buy one of Ray He's Happy Tree Range Chickens and check out our website to get all of Beth's recipes and find other local products that are good for people, good for the planet, and good for our local economy. Now, before we sign off tonight, we have a couple more surprises up our sleeve. We're gonna do a few drawings for swag and other items. You guys gonna draw? We will. We'll head yes. over to the table. <laughs> Let's go over there, Rissica. We can do the drawings. Shake it up real good. <laughs> Before we do the drawing, I want to tell you what we're drawing for. We've got a couple of packages. Some, the first one is an Invictus package from Invictus Brewing. Uh, it's valued at $75. There was one of them in the online auction as well. We're going to be giving one out 
to experience the craft brews from Invictus Brewing in Blaine. You'll get a growler refill, two branded glass beer glasses, a $25 gift card to Invictus, and a $25 gift, dollar gift card to the Tipsy Steer, the restaurant at Invictus. The, other, the second package we're drawing for is a $50 gift card to Clean Lakes, Minnesota, a Minnesota apparel company based in Gray Eagle, Minnesota, and they give back 10% of their proceeds for clean water. And then we have a couple of deluxe swag packages, which was a gift to tonight's host. And let me tell you what was in those packages. First of all, a beautiful handcrafted tea rest, organic and locally sourced tea, Darby's Nelson's book about the Minnesota River, one of the rivers we've talked so much about tonight, and a wild rice pancake mix from the Red Lake Nation Foods. These are what we're going to be drawing for tonight. So, Riska, let's go for our first one, uh, the, the Invictus Brewing Package. You want to pull a name out? Let's do it. Our first, very first winner. There we go. Our first winner is Rick Lowmiller. Congratulations, Rick. Congratulations. All right, and now for the $50 gift card to Clean Lakes, Minnesota. All right. Our second winner here is Kimberly mm -hmm. Chapel. Kimberly, congratulations. Well done. And then we're going to pull out a couple. We'll do two of the swag packages for the for two lucky folks. All right. So winner number 1 is David Wilhelm, congratulations, David. You get one of the swag packages and? And last but not least. Emily Javens, congratulations, <laughs> Emily, for winning one of our swag packages. Well, tonight has been a delight. And on behalf of everyone at Freshwater, thank you so much for your investments in the water that connects us. Keep giving in the ways you know how. Thank you and good night. That concludes our show, but please stick around for a brief message from the U.S. Water Alliance and Freshwater Board member, Renee Willette. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Renee Willette, and I'm a member of Freshwater's Board of Directors and Vice President of Program and Strategies for the U.S. Water Alliance. The U.S. Water Alliance is a national cross-sector nonprofit working to advance a one water future for all. And working at the national scale, I see how important statewide organizations are to protecting water resources and advancing a sustainable water future. The reason I give my time, energy, and financial contributions to fresh water is because I see the need for state-level leadership to convene multiple stakeholders and collaborate to protect freshwater resources and ensure that all Minnesotans can benefit from our incredible water culture. From healthy waterways to safe and reliable water services, our state needs science-based and community-driven solutions to protect our water. And I apologize I couldn't be with you tonight. I'm actually in Washington, D.C., working with federal partners on water issues. But this is why I'm heartened to be a part of Freshwater. Organizations like Freshwater are what we need to protect Minnesota's water future. So thank you for doing your part by being here tonight, by co contributing to Freshwater's mission, and together we can have a wonderful water future for all. Thank you. Hi, I'm Angie Kobler. I'm the horticulturist here at the CBS Conservatory on the beautiful St. Paul campus, University of Minnesota. And we are here to educate and inspire research and conservation. This is um, Nessicodon, and it's from the island of Mauritius. And it has a wonderful red nectar. I was happy to help with the Freshwater Society because I happen to be a water steward myself for the St. Croix watershed. I live in Hudson, and there are about 7,000 square miles of the St. Croix watershed. And of course, it's shared by both Minnesota and Wisconsin. So I was happy to find out that the Freshwater Society would be here promoting their own environmental cause. Thank you for joining us tonight for Water Connects Us, a celebration in support of Freshwater.
We'd like to thank our special guest, Beth Dooley. Our host, Laura Betker. Thank you to Ray He and his team. And our many fine sponsors who make our work possible. Thanks to these fine sponsors of Freshwater. We'd also like to thank our many hosts. And a special thank you to our steering committee. Thank you to the generous donors to our online auction. Thank you to our swag product partners. Thank you to our research team. A team of people that I pulled together because they're friends and longtime colleagues. A special thank you to our project funders. And to those who made tonight's show happen. Most importantly, thank you to you.